This is a DIY e-bike build with a motor that claims to be a thousand watts, but it doesn't matter because the controller peaks at 624 watts. It's made by a Chinese company called AW, which in addition to bike stuff, they make exercise equipment, archery gear, and stripper poles. So watch out. <laughs> I got it for $295. The battery is a unit pack power with rack. The price has been going up on these. I bought it for $410 and it disappeared for a while. And it came back at $395. So whatever that means for the future, is now the worst time to buy a battery or will it get worse? See, there was um, some variations of this, and I didn't know at the time. I was just like, I want the one with the LCD screen. There's a version that has a thumb throttle, which I came to decide that I want a thumb throttle. Not because there's anything wrong with a twist throttle. I'm doing a video about it, but basically I wanted a thumb because I have grip shifts, and it works. I mean, I've been riding it for months with the twist because, spoilers, it's hard to get a good thumb throttle, but I'm choosing it because it fits. I would have no problem with having a twist throttle. So first of all, none of this stuff is waterproof. It's not even water resistant. You're not gonna see any IP ratings anywhere, but I have ridden with it in the rain, not on purpose. That'll be another video. And uh, you know, there's some things you could do to secure yourself from that being an issue. But at the same time, this is not the kind of vehicle where you're like, oh, rain, it doesn't matter. So that aside, the other I guess pleasant surprise was that despite how I was kind of perceiving things about front wheel drive being uh, a good beginner's choice, but in terms of like your dream e-bike, it not being very good, I actually really like front wheel drive on a bike because I want to pedal. So when I have front wheel drive, I basically have a two wheel drive bike, which at a certain speed, my pedaling becomes less significant. If I really wanted to optimize for that, I could change the gearing on the bike, but still for commuting, front wheel drive is great. So we're putting on the front tire, the hub motor cable goes on the right. First thing, I'm gonna disable the brakes. Yeah, Allen wrench. Once you find what fits, they're basically using the same ones. It really is easier to do this stuff when it's upside down because you could drop it in. But later on, I did end up getting a kickstand that is way better for working on it. It's like a double kickstand, so it stands up symmetrically. So you're splitting these washers and you got one that has like a little tab and it's supposed to stick in between. I think when I put my torque arm on, I had to take one of those off. It's the only way it would fit. Okay, now the next step, which in the manual is the first step, but whatever, it's just easier to put the wheel on. Plugging in all the cables. Uh, oddly enough, a lot of my cables were plugged in. So I don't really know, as we'll find out, what the manual says and what you actually have to do. Sometimes aren't even the same thing. Whether or not I ended up with some returned unit, I don't know. Okay, so yeah, you got these cables. Uh, I don't know if these are waterproof. They have the look of waterproof. I mean, I hope they are, at least to some extent. They look like waterproof connectors and there's no way to cover them up, so they better be. All the ones that aren't, definitely aren't waterproof, like those SM plugs, they're a pain in the ass to work with. Not for plugging in, they're pretty easy, but if you gotta rewire them, oh my God, which you're gonna have to rewire them, maybe. Depending on how picky you are. If you like things to actually work, then you're gonna have to. Here, at this point, I was thinking, they give you this thing that's like a tiny little bag, they call it a controller bag. Like, I don't know how anything would fit in that. I ended up putting it on my other bike. It's really good for holding your phone and a couple other things. But maybe if you got something that's like a 250 watt or something like that, that's fine. But to do all this stuff where they say, oh, this is where you could put your controller box. Well, we got a bunch of non-waterproof cables. We're just supposed to leave them outside the bike. I mean, literally my battery came with like this tiny little compartment for the controller box. It's a huge battery. Like, there's no controller boxes that small that would be using this battery. I ended up putting my controller box in uh, pannier bags, plenty of room. I made like this plexi sandwich. So we got these brakes, they have these sensors that cut the motor when you push them in. So that's good. I flipped it over. It can stand on its own. It was just having trouble because the back wheel was flat. 
So yeah, I gotta change that back wheel. I got a Schwinn Cruiser uh, 1.95 in the rear. The front tire on this is a 1.75 width. The wheels are 26 inch. Yeah, some kickstands are really solid. The kind that are like a point, like a point that goes in the ground. Don't even, don't even trust those. Okay, so I'm taking off these horns. Uh, I really like having horns on my bike, but they won't be going back on. They don't fit, and I'm gonna have a mirror accessory. And it, I really don't find it necessary with this configuration. It doesn't help anything. So I like horns, but they won't be missed on this build. Uh, now I'm gonna spend forever looking for the right size uh, Allen wrenches to take off all this stuff, but Yep, here I am. I'm taking off the brakes, putting on the not as good, not as solid feeling brakes, but whatever, it's good. Okay, so here's the tiny one. It's hard for me to find because I got a lot of US standard Allen wrenches and they're just like piles of Allen wrenches. This is a three millimeter Allen key. The difference between having metric and standard becomes very apparent the smaller you go. So you got something really tiny and you don't have a metric, won't fit in there. It's things like this that take a surprising amount of time. I gotta get this grip first, and uh, I'm gonna use WD-40 uh, because it's uh, really on there. The easiest way to do this is to just like spray a little bit in there. It doesn't really matter which side, and then pull with both fingers. So it's not about twisting, don't twist, at least in this one. I just got it lubed up, and then I took two fingers and I pulled up straight. It goes from being impossible to coming off real easy. All this stuff comes off easy. And yeah, just make sure if your steering wheel is turned in a way where the cable is getting pulled, uh, turn it in the other way, and that way you have enough room to get it off without yanking on your cable. Yeah, this is an opportunity to do some cleaning. It's a dirty bike, and uh, I will... Uh, do an adequate job at cleaning it. I don't really get down to being perfect or anything, but I do wanna clean stuff when it's easier to do it. You gotta slide this stuff on, so you gotta get the order right. There's no sense in tightening things down because you'll find out what the proportion should be when you're actually sitting on it. To do the brake cable, you want it to be loose, you want it to be disengaged, and then you just slide it in so that the circle thing goes into the whatever Oh, there's that circle thing going into that whatever. <laughs> okay, so now I'm putting on that twist throttle. You know, I'm well aware that I'm entering a situation that isn't ideal, but in practice, it's totally rideable. It's just, I'd rather have a lever here. So, you know, we're putting together just to, to do it, but I'm well aware that this is not gonna be my final look for it. So now I'm gonna do uh, temporarily twist tying the wires because I am gonna be taking these wires on and off. I'm gonna be connecting and reconnecting stuff and. Don't waste your time trying to make things final right now. So here I am, I'm trying to figure out where to put this controller box at this point, which in the pannier bag, that's the answer. This thing, when people do that, it's the worst place. Really, this controller box is not shaped like a bike, first of all. It's just a burden. It's a burden of a box. And um, there's a lot of stuff on e-bikes that doesn't fit to a bike. Like, you'd see it on the wall of a network closet before you'd see it on a bicycle. Like, nothing's shaped. So here is the PAS, pedal assist sensor. It is not designed correctly. And one of the reasons it's so confusing is because it's just a thing that logically doesn't make any sense. I mean, literally you could see, it didn't make any sense to them either because you could see in the manual that they printed it one way and then realized that they had it being installed backwards, which in this case won't work. It, this doesn't work if you pedal backwards, which is a good safety thing. Too bad the sensor I ended up putting on it doesn't have that, but whatever the sensor I put on it is much better. Uh, this is just flawed, and we'll see. Yeah, I have taken this crank off so many times, but this is the first time I did it. Kind of confusing if you're not thinking about how it's constructed, but basically there is a nut in there, a, um, what is it, 14 millimeters? In the, I don't remember. The purpose of the bolt is to make sure the crank arm can't fall off. But when you're putting the crank arm on, it is what pushes it into place. So you take the bolt off, the crank arm is still gonna be on there. Like it's still seated pretty solidly. So you have to screw this thing in, into the threads all the way. And then you get an Allen wrench, turn it so that it pushes a thing through 
and pulls the crank arm off. So it's like you're threaded, you're on there, turning it like you'd be tightening it because you're making a thing push up against the bike that then makes it so the crank arm is pulled off the bike, if that makes any sense. So here's the stupid PAS sensor. Problem with this is that, so that's the way you have to install it. You put it up against the thing that is spinning, right? So you got your solid surface and it's up against your crank arm, which is spinning. And then the other side, there's a thing that also is a spacer. So the thing that actually spins is in the middle. Now, if you look at the manual on the page they printed out and glued over their mistake, it says it must be used with an Isis 20 tooth socket. Well, I appear to have that 20 teeth at least, but I couldn't get the pass to fit in the teeth. I couldn't even get it up to the teeth without modifying it to have a wider opening. And uh, it's plastic and you're supposed to mount this plastic thing into this metal thing and then you have your crank arm rubbing on the other side, constantly causing friction. It's just not very good. Obviously, this has to work on some bikes somewhere. It's just not a very good universal thing. You have too many situations where it's not going to work at all. By the way, if you haven't tested the motor or the battery yet, you should have done that before now. I didn't have my battery when I started, but I forged ahead anyway. So this is how you connect the battery to the existing control unit stuff. So these thick 10 gauge wires are what come with the battery. Then you step down to like 14 or 16 gauge. It's a little weird. I don't particularly care for that. I feel like that is a major weak point. So basically what I have to do is buy some terminals to then screw together O-rings and have mounting points. That red thing's the fuse. It's a 30 amp car fuse, you get them for super cheap. This came with two. And then there's this weird plug. And now this plug is, I don't know, I assume this is probably what plugs are like in China. Maybe wall plugs. Kind of unnecessary, because look where you have these actual, what I assume are waterproof connectors that are the actual connectors to the control unit. So there's no real reason for this plug to be here. Because you can connect up here, right? You got this, whatever, is it XT90 plug? They do nothing to tell you how you should connect it. It's just you got to raw wires and then you got to use your imagination. But I'm choosing to do something where by having the pole terminals, if something were to come loose, it's hard for it to come apart. So around this point, having worked on it and experienced how heavy it is, I was starting to to think maybe I upsold myself. Maybe. Maybe I don't need a thousand watt. Did I let myself get upsold? Am I driving the Hummer of e-bikes? Am I just some gaudy American who's always gotta be the biggest, most powerful? So I was thinking about like, oh, I should have done 500 watt motor with a 14 amp hour battery. That would have, well, it would have been a lighter bike. It would have been a cheaper bike. It was saved a couple hundred dollars. But after having made it, I realized that, well, I would probably be just as satisfied with a 500 watt motor and a smaller battery for a lighter ride. For this particular bike, which is the biggest frame bike I have, this is the best choice for what I had, which is something that has this amount of power. The amount of the distance I have to cover, it's about, say you're doing like a 50-50, right? Like you're at a pedal assist level three, you probably get like 50 miles on this motor. But there's times when I'm doing pedal assist five. So there's times when I'm throttling it when I just want to make time. So this, at the very minimum, I can comfortably do my commute back and forth. Even if I was on pedal assist five and just throttling it the entire way, it would be just fine. And so, you know, I'm doing about 30 miles. It's actually just right. I like the experience. I've been doing a lot of biking. It feels kind of like cheating in the beginning. I'm cutting my commute in half with this thing. So, it works. I'm not gonna worry about it. All right, Mitchie. Now onto the bike rack. We have two problems. It's a little too wide for this frame, so I have to modify how it attaches to the bike. And two, I'd say this bike rack is good everywhere except where it connects to the bike. Very solid, 
but where it connects to the bike, they're trying to be universal and there's no reinforcement. So basically what I got to do is I got to take an old style bike rack and I'm going to mount it to the bike, I'm trying to figure out how to put this thing together. These instruction manuals make IKEA manuals look brilliant. These tiny little pictures, you're just supposed to infer things. This can tell you something about the way they design things. So in the product page, there's a Photoshop picture of the bike rack on the bike in reverse. If that doesn't tell you enough, I found like a video putting it together, which actually had some different parts that were actually better. And I'm not sure if they replaced it themselves or if it was just a different iteration of this. In this case, I needed to modify the bottom to make it higher because I got to put a rack underneath. And I got to put a rack underneath because I don't want this entire battery, this 14.3 pound battery plus rack to be on just this one failure point, right? So I want some redundancy. I want a rack underneath that distributes some of the weight to different points on the bike. So the bike rack I'm using, this is like the old style bike rack. They had like these different, like old bikes, they just, they were different in the back. And they have this thing where you can like mount them, the same bike rack to all these kinds of bikes. So I have to drill holes in my frame, like threaded holes to be able to screw that into my frame. The problem with it is just the way it's made is it can fall apart. Bolts can fall out and then the whole thing will fall backwards while you ride. I mean, when you're riding on the side of the road, the side of the road sucks. The side of the road is where all the garbage is, all the shrapnel and rocks and broken glass. And you got sewer drains, you got more cracks are in the side of the road. You got dirt driveways just run out into the road. It sucks being on the side of the road. So when you hit like a bump and there's no rear suspension on this thing, everything's just shaking and vibrating and you got screws that come loose. You got anything you think is secure, you gotta double secure it. So I'm, I'm just trying to get ahead of that. So now I got these brackets, they're uh, mending brackets. I drilled some holes to be able to use them as extenders for the bottom of the rack. And then I painted it with what very little paint I had left. <laughs> really bad paint job, but whatever, it, it resembles black. And um, not even gonna give it a chance to dry. Just gonna just install it on there because I'm trying to get this thing done. And then this is what my brackets look like. This reinforcement, everything's Loctited. Yeah, watching out for that chain. Make sure you your things don't go in too far, your bolts. I stacked a bunch of washers to space out the difference. Back wheel comes off easy with this setup. I don't have to mess with anything. It's just disabling the brakes and dropping out the wheel. So this is my sheet metal fender that I had made. It would be better if it was a little longer. I was in the rain with it. I got a little splashing underneath my light, which is also where the charging port is, by the way. There's a rubber grommet there. I didn't have a problem, but some moisture had gotten underneath the rubber grommet. So here's making the plexi box. I just had this old plexiglass, super thick, cutting two to the same size, marking where the holes are gonna be. Uh, those are the terminals going on top. Hopefully that'll be temporary and eventually I will get them underneath. You know, they are covered by the actual bag. For the wires to go around and up and over and down into it, I couldn't do it the way I wanted to. Someday I'll get a larger pannier bag, a taller one, and punch a hole in the bottom. All my other wires are like too long. This is the only one that where it's too short. And uh, in this case, I'm just modifying it for now. To just to, I just want to get it working. I can fine tune stuff another day. We taped the two pieces together and we're drilling out the holes and we're basically starting with small pilot holes and then moving up in size. And uh, this should be efficient because everything is lined up. So there's no, supposedly there will be no human error. So we got this base. You're gonna lock take these all up when we know that it's what we want. And for the controller box, I ended up using these kind of Westinghouse thumb screws from like the 1920s, just because I had them, really. If I had something that was the right size, it wasn't that, I would have used it, but it's got the washers and the bolts, so I'm using it. And uh, I think I Loctited it. I hope I did. <laughs>
That's what it looks like. The wires go down the side, and then the sandwich will go on top. There's that stupid plug. So this is what it looks like. I got all these twist ties and stuff on it. I'm not done. I, I want to test it before I wrap stuff up and make it hard to take apart. So now we are epoxying the pass sensor on there. I don't know, when I tested it, you pedal forward, you pedal backwards. The motor runs both ways, so the direction of the arrow doesn't seem to matter, really. But you want to mount it this way because you don't want the wire to be sticking out forward and then wrapping around backwards. And as far as I could tell, you, you'd think I would have definitively written this down, but it doesn't work when you flip it the other way, which it would be nice if it did because then you get yourself a little extra room. If you could flip it over so that that sensor box was facing inwards on the bike, so that way the disc can be closer to it. But there's metal on the other side, and I'm pretty sure that that metal makes it so the signal box can't read anything. Uh, but I might be wrong. So it's like magnets, and it basically senses as the magnets go by. I've already cleaned it a bunch, but I'm going to sand the surface to make it rough so that epoxy can fill the cracks and grip. I'm putting it on the bottom with it facing slightly down because I don't want any water getting in where it's siliconed up there. So what we're going to do is take the old sensor and we're going to put some wax paper in between it and the sensor and then I'm going to tighten the crank arm down so that way it'll be a clamp. Like it'll press it in there and hold the thing on. So epoxy, you have two tubes, harmless when kept separate, but dangerous when combined or extremely useful, however you look at it. So you put equal amounts on a sacrificable surface and you mix them together with uh, like a scrap of wood, some kind of little thing. Yeah, then they become activated. And uh, I would say that this is, you think of crazy glue and how like people glue their fingers together. This is not allowed to touch your fingers. So just coating around the metal, going with making sure everything is fully covered, right? I don't really care if some squirts at the side. I want this to be solid. Get it just centered. Putting on the wax paper. So that way I don't glue my... Uh, old pass sensor onto my new sensor. Pushing this down with the flat side. Just holding it in place and now getting the crank arm on there. As I'm tightening, I'm just checking to make sure it doesn't slide, it doesn't, like I want it to be centered. And uh, looks good. I think I waited two days, but I think it's 24 hours is really what you have to wait. Okay, uh, now this is it welded on there. Okay, now the torque arm. People say, oh, do you put it in the front, you put it in the back. I put it in the back just because it's, uh, that's what manufacturers, where they show it. But it doesn't seem to matter. Uh, I bought a two pack. I thought I was gonna have both of them in the front and I didn't end up doing it. But definitely uh, don't skip this part. Okay, so this is what it comes down to. It's way more work than I thought it would be. But in the end, I wanted to do this, right? As much as I was at times super frustrated, it's a thing I wanted to do. I would say if you want a working commuter e-bike that is reliable, buy a specifically made e-bike. Don't do a conversion kit. Conversion kits, did I save money? I mean, I spent so much time that you can't really say you saved money if you're counting labor. So really what it comes down to is that I learned a lot about bikes and e-bikes and I will be making more in the future. And in the end, uh, what, what's my major issues with it? You know, I wish it had rear suspension. In a real commuter bike, I like having this front suspension, I really like it. But you go over bumps and I hear that stuff, even though I put some padding under my control box, so there's a little bit of a cushion for it. I don't like um, going over bumps and getting shocked. I went with the cushiest seat I can get, but I do wish it had rear suspension. I just, I'm used to having rear suspension in motorcycles and I would like it in bicycles that go 35 miles an hour. 
Uh, I also wish it was waterproof. I don't want to have to be so nervous about getting caught in the rain. It's very easy to get caught in the rain. It's just weather is unpredictable, right? Like it's just the nature of being on a bike is that you're going to get wet. So you don't want to worry about your control box or, or your battery, you know, short circuiting or whatever. So that's the experience of building an e-bike from a kit, the, a fairly cheap kit. And um, yeah, I think it's a worthwhile experience. And it is a bike that is practical. I use it a lot and um, that's it. <laughs>